A couple of very strange happenings recently have gotten my noggin a joggin. In the UK, shortly after Brexit finally went through, took you guys long enough, there was that segment of the BBC show Horrible Histories, where they basically talked about how all of those things that are considered to be quintessentially British aren't actually from the UK at all. Your empire's built on fighting wars, that's how your income's swollen. Your British things are from abroad, and most are frankly stolen. Whatever next? Go on, pray tell. Our British Queen is foreign as well. It's true, I am of foreign descent. And your husband, Albert? A German gent. At least I've got a British name. Victoria's Latin. That's a shame! British things, British things. There are none we declare. All our favourite British things seem to come from elsewhere. Jesus, they did the Queen dirty in that video. Look, look at look at this face, man. Last week, a very similar video was put out uh, over in Scandinavia by a Scandinavian airline talking about how there is nothing fundamentally Scandinavian. What is truly Scandinavian? Get out, please. Absolutely nothing. Nada. Niente. There is no such thing. Everything is copied. Scandinavia was brought here. Piece by piece. By everyday people who found the best of our home away from home. Remember, this is a video designed to sell you a product. What kind of brainlet thought up this marketing pitch? Hey guys, how do you get people to buy our airline tickets? I don't know, maybe we should tell them that their national identity doesn't exist. Brilliant! They'll be so demoralized they'll all buy the next flight out! Now this push of your own institutions demonizing the very people that they're supposed to be serving. This might be new for the Brits or for the Scandinavians, but it's something that Canada's had to deal with for a little while now. Back in 2015, Justin Trudeau gave one of his first post-election interviews with the New York Times. In the interview, Trudeau stated, There is no core identity, no mainstream in Canada. There are shared values, openness, respect, compassion, willingness to work hard, to be there for each other, to search for equality and justice. Those qualities are what make us the first post-national state. It would seem to me that these qualities, they are the core identity. And they certainly are a part of a Canadian nationalism. But nonetheless, Trudeau has felt for a while now that Canada is the first post-national state. There is no Canada, in a sense. However, the shorthand, there is no Canada, does not actually literally mean there is no Canada. In much the same way that when the airline says there's nothing about Scandinavia that's, that's inherent, they don't mean that either. And the same with, with the British example. The more practical interpretation of what they're saying is that the definition of what being a Canadian is, or being a Brit is, or whatever, can and should be widened to include more people. And there is some logic to that. If you're going to have a nation where immigrants come in, and those immigrants are there to become Canadians, or to become British, or to become Swedish or Norwegian or whatever it happens to be, if they're there not only to live in their new home, but adopt the customs of the place that they're arriving to, then yes, you can make an argument that the definition of what a Canadian is should be expanded to include those people. We're talking about the honest immigrants. The ones who see opportunity here work through the legal process and understand that even though their children will be culturally more like the nation they've come to live in rather than the nation that they came from, they're still going to have a better life. When my grandparents moved from Italy to Canada, they understood that their family line as the generations continued on would not be Italian anymore, but the family would continue on. That was the important part, and it did. And that is why, fundamentally, a lot of immigrants have been welcomed into the West with open arms, because up until recently, that policy has actually kind of worked because they were willing to integrate. However, the very fact that they have something to integrate into means that there is a core identity. There is a mainstream. There is a Canada. There is a Britain. Both Sargon and Arch Warhammer have done variations of this idea, and both of them, in their videos, talk about the things that their homelands have contributed to the world. And you know what? I can do the same. Believe it or not, Canada's actually done quite a bit. We invented keyframe animation, the IMAX movie theater, and the trackball. We invented pablum, canola oil, the Macintosh apple, peanut butter, instant mashed potatoes, ginger ale, poutine, the Nanaimo bar, butter tarts, probably why I'm so fat, the walkie-talkie, amplitude modulation, standard time, the atomic clock, the Blackberry, the Pager, the 56K modem, wheelchair accessible buses, 
the baggage check, hydrofoil boats, jetliners, electric streetcars, the Canadarm, that one's a big deal, the snowmobile, the electric wheelchair, the compound steam engine, the snowblower, the foghorn, the gas mask, the G-suit, the pipe mine, sonar, lacrosse, basketball, hockey, table hockey, the goalie mask, five pin bowling, the instant replay on TV, the electron microscope, the Ebola vaccine, plexiglass, the garbage bag, the Caesar, the, uh, the drink, by the way, the cardiac pacemaker, the wonder bra, the alkaline battery, the caulking gun, the egg carton. The point is, like every other nation, Canada has invented its own share of stuff. And like every other nation, Canada has either inherited or adopted other inventions from other nations. This idea that there is nothing fundamentally Canadian, or British, or Scandinavian, or French, or German, or any other place, it's just nonsense. If you go back into the 80s, the multicultural dream of the time was nations working together peacefully, all bringing their own points of view and their ideas to the table to synthesize something greater, something better for humanity. There was a recognition that all nations at the table existed, that they were all fundamentally different, but that they coexisted peacefully, and that they were willing to work together for everyone's benefit. But that doesn't seem to be what multiculturalism is anymore. Now it just seems to be the erasure of those that, I guess, the radical left considers to be oppressive? In that Scandinavian video they mentioned, um, we're no different from our Viking ancestors. We're no better than our Viking ancestors. Well, it seems like the modern Scandinavian is a cuck. He's definitely not capable of raping and pillaging the way that Vikings used to. And of course, there's the added hilarity of it coming from a black person. We was actually Vikings. But more importantly, if the criticism is that the Scandinavians have blood on their hands historically, name me a people that doesn't. Canada treated its native population terribly. No one can deny that the Vikings actually did rape and pillage. And I'm sure the British, back when they were the world hegemon, did some pretty distasteful things. But are any of us that now? You can't draw a moral equivalence between what, say, my ancestors used to do as a Canadian and what a person from the Middle East or Africa does right now. Obviously, not all people from those places are backwards and violent. In fact, a lot of them are probably fleeing backwards violence. But this really feels like an erasure disguised as multiculturalism. And if you object, they'll simply throw the sins of your ancestors in your face. Which, by the way, is a ploy to get you to accept the sins of the people coming in, who are alive right now. Yes, Canadians in the past did a pretty bad extermination job on the native peoples that used to live here. But that does not compare to jihadis that come into Canada now and want to see the destruction of the nation that they're entering. If only by virtue of the fact that they're doing it right now, as soon as Trudeau won his second election, he announced a pilot project to bring mass immigration to Canada. The cities that he selected for mass immigration are primarily places that are semi-isolated. They're further north than places like Toronto. They're colder. They're rougher industry-based cities. And, potentially unfortunately for me, my city is on the list. Let's see what some people who, uh, who live in this city of mine think about this. And unfortunately, unlike in the UK where the working class north rose up against the far left, it seems like the people here are quite happy to see it happen. This is great. In a lot of cases, immigrants make better, more compassionate neighbors than we are. A Syrian refugee-owned restaurant downtown announced today they are feeding the homeless and the less fortunate between Christmas and New Year's. I'm very much looking forward to more diversity up here. And you know what? I know exactly what Syrian refugee family he's talking about. I know the restaurant. I know the family. And yeah, they're good people. These were legitimate refugees who came to Canada because Syria was getting fucking destroyed. And you know what? they're actually starting to integrate. That would be the kind of immigrant I would be happy to have here. In a couple of generations, they will likely just be Canadians. Good, we're experiencing a pretty severe labor shortage. We need some new blood. So far, my experiences with immigrants in Sudbury have been overwhelmingly positive. That and the fact that my grandparents immigrated to Sudbury, which is probably true of a great many Sudburyans. And to be honest, I immigrated here. Uh, I mean, I'm obviously Canadian, but I moved to this city. This is not my home city. And Sudbury is definitely a city of immigrants. It, it started as a mining town and it had to bring workers in from the outside. But here's the problem with the whole labor shortage thing. That means that companies need to start paying more for labor. It is in fact good for the worker since wages go up, that the price of labor is high. Do you know what mass immigration does? It drives wages down. If you're experiencing a pretty severe labor shortage, now is the time for you to make your money. Now is not the time to flood the city with a whole bunch of migrants who will work for pennies on the dollar. Then of course you get this person. Good, get some much needed diversity. What do you mean much needed? 
Are, are the native Canadians here not good enough for you to hang out with? Sudbury is already a pretty big hodgepodge between the English-speaking community, the French-speaking community, and the Aboriginal community. Is that not diverse enough for you? Or does diversity mean London-style acid attacks and machetes being swung around downtown? Was it a crisis or a tragedy when waves of Italian immigrants came here? Or Finns or Ukrainians? No, I agree it wasn't, because they integrated. Because they integrated. They brought their expertise, they brought their work ethic, they brought their unique culture, and they became Canadians. Islamic immigration is not the same as Italian or Finn or Ukrainian. Canada is bringing in immigrants from places that don't like the West. They don't like Canada, they don't like the States, they don't like the UK. And yeah, you know what? There are certainly going to be some immigrants like that Syrian family that I know who came here to escape the oppression. But how many terrorist cells do you think are coming in along with? Or hell, forget about the terrorist cells. How many people do you think are coming here to eventually agitate for Sharia law? And the reason that people here just aren't objecting the way they would in the UK or in the States is because of this idea that Canada is post-national, that there is no essential Canadianness. We are geographically, and in some ways culturally, very similar to America. But in other ways, we're very much like continental Europe. And I think it's to our detriment. To wrap a bow on this whole topic, we need to talk about the Laurentian Consensus. The Laurentian Consensus is basically the idea that most of Canada's political power is centered on cities that are along the St. Lawrence River. And ever since the initial colonization by the British and the French, these locations have been the political heartland of Canada. However, in the past 50 years, things have began to wildly shift. The oil discoveries in Alberta and Newfoundland have drastically changed the politics of those locations. Asian immigration into British Columbia, a far more integrative form of immigration than, say, Islamic immigration into Toronto, has made the Western provinces more Pacific-oriented, turning them away fundamentally from the Laurentian Consensus. As early as 2011, political analysis have noticed that the Laurentian Consensus has been basically losing its clout within a united Canada. Trudeau himself comes from this class of people within Canadian society. And as he governs Canada, he does so with an Ontario-centric focus. I don't know if you guys have heard, but Canada's kind of on fire right now. <laughs> Trudeau's mismanagement of the Alberta oil sands is coming into full view. British Columbia politics are simply alien to him, and the Maritimes have felt like they've been hung out to dry for the past 15 years. Let me read you this passage from this article. And if you're a Brit or you're an American, let me know if the person being described sounds familiar to you. Historically, the Laurentian elite were Upper Canadian Anglo-Protestants and Quebecois patricians, and their descendants still dominate the upper strata of politics, the bureaucracy, crown corporations and agencies, academia, and the media private sector membership tends towards legacy industries, often dominated by multi-generational families. The media, particularly the CBC, project the consensus across the country. The Laurentian elite members have remarkable mobility among the upper levels of Canada's government, business, and the bureaucracy. Today's Laurentian elite is also arguably our franchise of the mobile, transnational professional class. The Anywheres, as discussed in Stephen Harper's book. They are, according to Harper, urban and university-educated professionals who have become genuinely globally oriented in their careers and personal lives. As anywheres, the Laurentians largely reflect the universal, broadly leftist monoculture. Their personal ethos is typically secular and socially progressive. Today, this includes much of the postmodern canon, intersectionality, quantifying privilege, and the seemingly incessant signaling of virtue. Economically, they range from socialist to corporatist, businessmen who actively seek advantage from deals with the government while typically promoting the social progressive agenda. If you're a Brit, maybe that sounds like the London bubble. If you're an American, maybe it's Silicon Valley, Hollywood, or New York. Canada has it too. And these people would definitely be the type to say that there is no Canadianness, that my country has no core identity, that there's nothing special about it, that there's nothing uniquely British or uniquely Scandinavian. There's an advertisement, it's about 20 years old now, you can find it on YouTube, but it definitely looks like a video that's 20 years old. It was for the Canadian brand of beer. For those of you who don't know, it's literally just called Canadian. It's a, it's a great Canadian export. I guess we make good beer. And it was a Canadian person talking about all the things that he loves about Canada. And that was the pitch as to why you should buy this beer. Can you imagine this advertisement being made nowadays? In an era where somebody who wears the Union Jack as a suit gets thrown out of a bar in the UK. In an era of open borders activism, and where any immigration policy makes you a racist. When a German politician waves a German flag, and Angela Merkel decides to steal it from him and shake her head. When a very simple, very positive slogan, Make America Great Again, is considered the height of offense. The 20th century was a lesson in the dangers of blind nationalism. I can understand why some people might react to those horrors by trying to push the idea that there is no nation at all. But these people are what I like to call idiots. 
there can be a nationalism that is welcoming to all those who wish to adopt the nation's core values. There can be a nationalism that is not mindlessly prideful, but is instead grateful for what they have inherited, and means not only to iterate on it, but to synthesize it with like-minded individuals. There can be a Canadian nationalism that doesn't simply hate everything non-Canadian, but views the Americans, the British, the French, and any other nation that adopts the core values of individual freedom and human rights as old friends. Competing with them, yes, but fundamentally in the spirit of cooperation. Competition designed not to destroy your opponent, but to see what heights both you and they could reach. To me, that would be something fundamentally Canadian. That would be part of our core identity. No amount of radical leftist post-nationalism screeching will take that away. And I have a feeling that as long as they continue to screech, they're going to keep losing arguments. And more importantly, they're going to keep losing elections.